There is the Elbert House, which no longer exists. And this is the town. There is the sunken road. See the stone wall there? And there is the paragraph. The paragraphs are important because they're surrounded by a large board fence. It's about 200 yards by 100 yards. And here you have the swale. Now the swale is important. Why? Because that's where you can get your tug mother earth. Just like you hug your mother. <laughs> now look at that white, look at the uh, white car. You can see the swale, which means I could be laying on the ground. And I could not be. See the building that's the far, far away the swale. Then, just like Kershaw says, that is the first place where you have hug Mother Earth, and when you come further, you're in deep doo-doo. And then remember, he spikes about the next. And the next one is going to be where the canal is, where those buildings are. So you've got these various danger points. And what we're going to send up here, the first division is going to be William Frank. This is old blanking. <laughs> you got to break one eye. You drove Jackson out of the army. A good artillerist. And he is going to attack with three successive brigades. This is the same division that old Brinke commanded at Antietam. He's going to have Kimball out in front. Kimball is his veteran brigade. He should have used them at Antietam in his first wave or his second wave and they might have broke the Confederate line. And his 7th West Virginia is there and also the 14th Indiana. And then they're followed by the other two brigades. Andrews, who commands the brigade that was commanded by not Colonel Weber, but Colonel Baker, because he was born in the fatherland and ran the bar in New York City. And then they're followed by uh, at, uh, they're followed by the brigade uh, commanded by Palmer, which at Antietam was commanded by Dwight Morris. And they are going to lose about 1,100 men. Do you have anything about them? I don't. Now, as soon as they're repulsed, who's going to come? The one who read this graphic description. Hancock. And the first brigade is going to be Zook's brigade. Then it's going to be your all your favorite brigade, the Irish brigade. And bringing up the rear is a notorious coward, Caldwell's brigade. They're going to lose 20 one hundred men. The most of any Union command. So that means you've already slaughtered two divisions of the Second Corps. Now up in, in the cupola of the City Hall is Darius Couch. And that's when he reads. He moans and, and all but weeks, see how my poor men fall. But he's got more to it yet, because Oliver Otis Howard, that will be his last division, is going to attack almost over the same ground. Though the right brigade, Sully's, will be more uh, to the west, or the, uh, to the uh, west, of Hanover Road than the other people were. So you're going to get three Union divisions. But that isn't all. Because when Howard attacks, 
the Ninth Corps has joined. And everybody likes Sam Sturgis because they like his description of John Pope. I do not give for John Pope a pinch of owls down. And he will be attacking over closer to the visitor center. That means when Howard is attacking, there are really two divisions attacking here. Howard in this area, and Sturgis is over there. Now the last division that goes through this very ground we're standing will be A.A. A. Humphreys. Now these men don't do much fighting. A lot of them are nine-month regiments. And he has two brigades. Alabox Brigade goes forward in line of battle, just like the others. But Humphreys decides to have Tyler's Brigade advance by regimental column. That is narrow front and great depth. And there's good evidence they may have got even further than the Irish Brigade, because advancing on a narrow front with great depth. Now how well, now the they have two things, two descriptions. They come marching forward singing patriotic songs. The Confederates say when they go to the rear, they're howling in anguish. So it's a difference of this, uh, between Confederates saying, the Union saying they're coming forward singing patriotic songs and howling in anger when they go. Now the other attacks here will be over where Griffin will be later and Jetty will be. So you're going to have a slaughter pen here. Anything by any those? I've got Humphrey's report. All right, let it read Humphrey's before I do that. Humphrey's division had not seen action in they arrive after the battle. So most of the men in Humphrey's division to attack here. This is their first battle. And these are the men who enlisted for nine months service to avoid being drafted either into, into I, rather than listed in a three-year regiment or being drafted into a nine-month regiment. So this, this, they, these men are going to see the elephant for the first time. Imagine what's going through their mind as they're crossing over thousands of dead and wounded that have already Humphrey's name, he has to wear glasses all the time, so he's known as Old Goggle Eye. And he doesn't have as loud a voice as Henry, but the men that serve under him says he has a better vocabulary of exit for leaded than Hancock has. He's one tough bastard. Yes. <laughs> According to Humphreys, I was satisfied that our fire could have but little effect and that the only mode of attacking him successfully was with the bayonet. So he's going to attempt to do a bayonet assault here instead of standing up in the open in linear formation and firing at troops behind a stone wall. He thinks if he can move across this ground rapidly, he can assault and take care of the heights with the bayonet. This I resolved to do, <coughs> although my command was composed of troops that entered the service in August. With great difficulty, their firing was arrested chiefly by the exertions of myself and staff and Colonel Wallabach. You know who's making him not fire? The ranking people. Right. While this was being done, I sent a staff officer to General Tyler with instructions to bring his command to the left of the road, left of the road in the ravine and prepare to support or take the place of Wallabach brigade. The charge was then made, but the deadly fire of musketry and artillery broke it after an advance of 50 yards. The greater part of my staff were now on foot, having had their horses killed or disabled. Mounting the horse of my special orderly, I rode to General Tyler's brigade to conduct it from the enemy. And while doing so, received three successive orders from General Butterfield, that's the 5th Corps commander, to charge the enemy's line. The last order being accompanied by the message that both General Burnside and General Hooker demanded that the crest to be taken before night. It was already growing dusky. Tyler's brigade was not yet entirely formed and was impeded in doing so by a battery of six guns whose limbers occupied a part of the ground and whose fire would have rendered it impossible 
for him to advance. With great difficulty, I brought this battery to cease firing. Then, riding along in two lines, I directed them not to fire, that it was useless, that the bayonet alone was the weapon to fight here. Anticipating, too, the serious obstacle they would meet with in the masses of men lying under the little shelter afforded by the natural embankment in front, who could not get out, who could not be got out of the way. I directed them to disregard these men entirely and to pass over them. I ordered the officers to the front, and with a hurrah, the brigade, led by Tyler and myself, advanced gallantly over the ground under the heaviest fire yet, yet open, which poured upon it from the moment it rose from the ravine. Obviously, it didn't succeed. He said the biggest problem was that his troops were thrown in while the other ones were still here, and they impeded his advance. Even though he got within 50 yards of the stone wall, could not get any farther because they were shot down. Now, many of the wounded men will grab at the well man and urge them not to go forward. They've seen, so what is going across this ground, there's been French, there has been Hancock, there has been Howard, and now there's Humphreys. That's four divisions, in essence, has gone over the same ground. Now, when Humphreys retreats, he, he ends his report by saying, as soon as the troops were placed in their new position, they were directed to occupy, that they were directed to occupy, parties were sent out to bring in the wounded and the dead, and the division ambulances and stretcher bearers were dispatched upon the same errand. The latter, however, had scarcely any stretcher, the repeated requisitions for the same never having been filled. They were obliged to use the shutters from the window. The wounded were nearly all brought in before daylight. I ordered out burying parties the following night.